turn to number 198. Let's stand and sing the first and last. There's power in the blood. 
piece of watermelon some months ago was struck with its beak. I took some, some of the seeds and dried them and weighed them and found that it required some 5,000 seeds to weigh a pound. And I applied the mathematics to a 40 pound melon. One of these seeds put into the ground when warm by the sun and moistened by the rain takes off its coat and goes to work. Gathers from some bird 200,000 times its own weight, and forcing this raw material through a tiny steel constructs a weapon. Its ornaments, it ornaments the outside with the covering of green. Inside the green, it puts a layer of white, and within the white, a core of red, and all through red, it scatters seed each one capable of containing the work of reproduction. Who drew the plan by which a living seed works? Where did its tremendous strength come from? Where does it find its coloring matter? How does it collect its flavor extract? How does it develop a water bed? Until you can explain a water bed, do not be too sure that you can set limits on the power of the Almighty and say what he would do and how he would do Kick down out. Let's have a faith this week in all of that. Yes, someone's going to get saved this week. Let's stand in prayer. Our Father, our kingdom come, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. We forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. 
Don't pray for me this morning. Uh, I fell asleep last night in the trailer. I, I dreamt all night that I was a muffler, and I woke up this morning just exhausted. <laughs> it's good to see Brother Mike here. Mike keeps my truck running. He's a good mechanic. If, he, if I had a Ford truck and he kept it running, he'd be a magician. <laughs> Somebody told me how you can double the value of a Ford truck. Just put in a half tank of gas. I don't think much there. Come on, this is funny stuff. Right? Yeah. Go ahead and open your Bibles, please. The book of Psalms. The book of Psalms. We're going to be in the first Psalm this morning. Psalm 1. <coughs> Mention quickly that the CDs are back there. And as we've done since 2020, it's just the sets of CDs. Uh, that are back there in the, the two children's books. So if you're interested in those, remember all that goes to help offset the cost of our mission trips. We have not stopped with mission trips. We had them postponed. And because they were postponed, everything happened in one year. So already this year, uh, we've been to Germany, which included little trips to uh, Amsterdam, Luxembourg, Belgium, and France. And then uh, straight from Germany, I dropped Kimberly off. Uh, on one airline at one airport, drove to another airport and flew to Trinidad <coughs> there for almost three weeks. And then in just a little while now, October the 30th, we begin in Isawa, Japan. It now looks as if Japan will be opened back up for tourist travel. We're working on uh, getting a sponsor. We're going to have to have a sponsor and uh, pulling out the e-system. Uh, you've never needed a visa from the United States to go to Japan, but because of COVID, uh, it's, uh, Japan is actually still the most locked down of any major industrial nation, but it looks like that's coming to an end sometime here in the month of September, and uh, uh, we might not even have to do all that other paperwork, but we're going get, to uh, get all that started as well, but we'll be in Misawa, Japan, starting on the 30th of October, and we'll go from there. Uh, to the uh, city of the island of I uh, Okinawa, and we'll be there for two weeks, and then we'll go from uh, Okinawa to Iwakuni, and from Iwakuni to Yokosuka, and to Yokota, and then to Yokosuka, Japan. So pray for that. We don't usually do three mission trips in one year, uh, but because of COVID, everything kept getting pushed back and pushed back until it all ended up in all of 2022. So uh, pray for us about that and if you'd like to help with that anything you buy off the cd table goes to help offset the cost of those mission trips look at psalm one psalm one uh i was asked to speak at a men's conference and uh I chose this passage of scripture that was given a, a title a topic i was supposed to discuss and it was this happiness requires decisions when you get to psalm one and you get to that very first word notice that first word Blessed. And everybody knows that. We, all, we either say, you'll hear some people say, blessed is the man. But most of the time we say, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. 
And uh, sometimes when we read a verse in the Word of God, uh, remember that the Word of God is translated from two different languages, actually three. There's uh, some small passages that are Aramaic in there, but mostly it's from Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament. And sometimes words that are translated don't have a perfect uh, marriage to another word in the other language. For instance, in this passage, the word blessed or blessed actually can mean blessed or it can also mean happy, but it doesn't just mean happy. It's, a, it's so much bigger a word than that. It actually means, basically, we can put it this way, it basically means, oh, so happy. That's what it really means. When you read that, it's not just blessed, because we look at that and we almost overuse that word. Well, bless your heart. Don't we use that in the wrong way nowadays? Bless oftentimes means I'm going to say something negative about you, but before I say something negative about you, I want it to sound spiritual. So I'm going to say bless your heart. You ever done that? Oh, my. She sure has gained a whole lot of weight. Bless her heart. <laughs> you're not really giving her a compliment. You're not really blessing her, but you're actually just making your negative comment sound spiritual by asking, bless her heart. Oh, boy, his hair sure is thinning. Bless his heart. Yeah, that's right. You don't mean that. You don't mean the blessing. What you're really saying is, boy, he's getting bald. That's what you're really saying. And to make yourself feel better, you add, bless his or her heart, right? But that's not what it means when you read it right here. It's not just, bless his heart is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. It is, oh, so happy. I mean, not just happy, not just thrilled, but overflowing with happiness is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. It goes on, and you know the verses, but standeth or standeth the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, and we'll get to that here in just a moment. And the world likes to think, and by the way, even Christians like to think, that there's one or two little things that you can have, one or two things that you can earn, one or two things that you can achieve. Well, if I just had his house, I'd be happy. If I yeah. just had his beautiful Cadillac that's sitting out there. Like, <laughs> I told him last night, that's a, new, that's a new illustration, the pastor driving the pretty Cadillac. <laughs> The Lord provided that, so we'll, we'll just leave it alone and not say anything else about the, the leather seats and the beautiful upholstery inside that car. We'll leave that alone for the rest of the week. But we say, well, if I just, if I just had his, uh, his house, if I just looked as good as she looks, or something along that line, if I can just achieve this one thing, then I'm going to finally be happy. I'm finally going to be satisfied. I'm finally going to be Blessed, but that's not what the Bible tells us. Remember Psalm 37 and verse 4, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he will give thee the desires of thy heart. The way to be happy, the way to be blessed, the way to be oh so happy is described for us in this passage of scripture. It actually helps us to understand some of the things that are going on in our in our lives and in our world, in Bible-believing churches. And in our society today, are easy to understand when you just look at what this passage says. Why are people never content? Why are people never happy? Why are people who receive so much in this nation? Think about this for just a moment. There is no nation like this one. Uh, our worst people in poverty have more than some of the richest people in some of the countries right. around the world. It's hard to even define what poverty is anymore with what is given and what is handed out and all the organizations, all the government programs that make sure that no one in this country should do without. And yet people still aren't happy. No matter how much money they have, they just want more. No matter how many businesses they own, they want another one. No matter how, how many inventions they come up with, they want to invent something else. They're never happy because they're doing it the wrong way. Happiness requires decisions. Yes. I want you to look at the first kind of decisions. Let's just read the psalm together, the whole thing. And I want you to see all the words. And I need to be done at 15 till or 10 till. Either one's fine. Either one's fine. All right. How about five till? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We pulled our trailer last night, and I slept I slept great, in spite of the, the muffler dream. And so I'm kind of a little I'm full of my oats this morning, is what my <laughs> grandmother would say. So I hope I don't say anything silly here in just a moment. But notice what the passage says. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree 
planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit and his seeds and his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Happiness requires decisions. We're going to look at two different types of decisions, and then when we finish this morning, we'll be looking at why people aren't happy because they're not making those decisions, and the decisions that you and I still need to make as we move forward in our Christian lives. All right, let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for our time together. Lord, I ask that you bless the message this morning. Father, I ask that you guide and direct our hearts and our ears, and may the Word of God find fertile soil in the hearts of, of your people today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the first kind of decisions that we see, notice how the, the book begins. Notice how the psalm begins and the book of Psalms begins. Blessed is the man that walketh not. It does not begin by telling us what you need to do to be oh, 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 so happy. It tells us what we need to not do to be oh, so happy. See, there are decisions of discretion that the child of God needs to make. we got to remember something about this Bible that we preached from this morning. It is filled with... With don'ts. It is filled with nots. It is filled with thou shalt nots. It is filled with the things that you cannot do, that you're not allowed to do. And you know, if you go through the Word of God, a whole lot of problems in our lives and in our world would dissipate. They'd be completely gone if we just didn't do what the Bible tells us not to do. How many pitfalls are surrounding us? By doing the things that God has warned us not to do. And once you start doing the things that you've been told not to do, then you decide that there's nothing that you're uh, not required to do. You can do anything you want to, as long as it makes you feel better. What kind of mess is our world in right now just because people are doing what they want to do? What they feel like they ought to do? Or excuse me, don't put it this way. What they identify with. Yeah. I saw a news, a news video the other day from Sweden or Switzerland, one of those two places, that this woman has now self-identified with a cat. She walks into buildings and she stands there and she licks her hands and she meows and she purrs and her husband hasn't figured out what to do because she has completely identified with the cat. And he says, I can't do anything about that because that's just what she you start living by what you feel instead of what the Bible tells you, you're going to be in a mess every single time. I want you to know the Bible's filled with don'ts. Think about how many different times the Word of God says don't. Psalm 3 and verse 6, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Or Psalm 56 and verse 4, in God I will promise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Or Psalm 119 and verse 16, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Or 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, therefore I will not be negligent, but you always in remembrance of these things. Though you know them and be established in the present truth. Or Psalm 101 and verse 3. And I, I will set a wicked thing before mine eyes. You think how, how different David's life would have been if David had just lived by that one, I will not, that he wrote. He'd have gone right back into the house after he saw Bathsheba, would he not? He said, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. And so the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 18, But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. How many different heroes of the word of God live their life by a thou shalt not, I will not, I won't be negligent, I won't look at the wrong thing, I won't go to the wrong place. Decisions of discretion are all through the word. Isn't it funny how you can look around and see people who used to come to church, used to be sitting right here in these very pews, used to be uh, serving the Lord, used to be helping in all of the ministries that are going on here. Now they don't go to church. Now they started, they've decided to believe something completely differently. By the way, some in our own families have decided just to believe completely differently than what they've always believed. Why? Because they never made the thou shalt not. Right. Yeah. 
Bible is not just going to tell us who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. It's going to describe to us exactly how to get to that oh so happy. Have you ever noticed how people who used to come to church, now they've decided they want to live by their feelings. They want to live by what they think. They want to live by not the decisions of discretion. It doesn't matter whether the Bible says not to do it or not. If they want to do it, they're going to do it. And imagine how many of them have come to decisions like these. Do you know, in our society today, they are telling, they are telling us, and I think the last number I saw was 54 different genders. 54 different genders. Now, I know I'm old. I'll turn 59 okay. years of age in, in November. But when I grew up, there were only two. And by the way, there are still only two. Amen. A male and female created he, them. Yep. God Almighty chose two genders. You, th you realize when he uh, created man and woman, he could have made man and woman and something else and something else and something else. But God shows that there would be two genders. Isn't it amazing, though, that, that whole group of people, you can be anything you want. You can be a man becoming a woman, a woman becoming a man, a man becoming something else or something. You can be cisgender. I don't even you have to. You have to sit there and listen as people begin to describe their one child as they. I don't know. I realize I'm old again. But when I think of they, I remember learning that in school. They meant more than one person. Do you know why they refer to a single transgender person as a they? Because if they used it grammatically correct, you would call them an it. It is the singular second person, not they. That's the plural second person. So imagine what would happen if somebody got up and said, yes, my child can't decide whether it's a male or female, but I still love it. Just think what would happen around our world today. How many people would lose their minds? It is okay to be a he, she, a she, he, or whatever you want to be. But you know what it's not okay to be? It's not okay to be a red-blooded, yeah. gun-toting, hard-working American male in today's society. What would happen if a man got up, a politician got up, I think we know because we've had a couple of them that have done it, and just said, listen, I'm a man. I don't struggle with whether I'm a man or not. I'm a man. I'm not saying that you're not a man. I'm saying if you want to be a woman, uh, then you're not really a man like I am. I'm sorry. It's just that simple. I can't be much more honest than that this morning. Brother Harvard, that's not politically correct. No, it's biblically correct. Though. Yeah, right. 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 You can be anything you want to be, but you stand up and say, listen, I'm just a woman, a God-fearing woman. I want to love my husband. I want to I want to clean the house and I want to cook meals and my husband's going to put me on a pedestal and treat me like a queen. That's what I am. Do you realize the kind of vilification you would take if you posted that? If you tweeted that or posted that on Facebook, there'd be 10,000 people that you never met in your life telling you that you're a sexist because you announced that you are what you are. How does that make you? It's amazing. You can have any book in your lap when you go to church, any version of the Word of God, but you immediately say that you believe in the King James Bible. All of a sudden, you're just some stick in the mud, old fuddy-duddy that's out there just trying to be divisive. No. Why is it that you can choose anything that you want to and tell me it's okay to make any choice that I want, but if I choose to believe the right Bible, then that choice I'm not allowed to make. Yeah. You can have any music in your church. You can have strobe lights. You can have fog machines. You can have drum sets. But if you say something about loving good old-fashioned hymns right out of the hymnal, all of a sudden you're just old-fashioned. All of a sudden you're antiquated. All of a sudden you don't know what you're talking about. It's okay to dress any way you want to dress as long as you don't try to dress like a Christian. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever noticed that? It's okay to be any denomination. It's okay to be interdenominational or non-denominational. But you tell somebody that you're an independent Baptist, all of a sudden they hate you with every fiber of their being. Yeah. These tolerant people are tolerant of anything and anybody as long as they don't stand up for something and believe in something. Yeah, they have more tolerance for the LGBT than they do for the IFB. By the way, if you're not familiar with those terms, LGBT, you look that up when you go home. IFB means independent fundamental Baptist. Isn't it amazing? You can believe any belief system that you want. Just don't stand up and say you believe the word of God. 
You can listen to any music you want. Just don't stand up and say you like old-fashioned hymns. You can hang out any place that you want to hang out. But I'm here to tell you something. You post or say something about going to church on Sunday night or all day Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. There will be people that will come out of the woodwork. It will be one of the most viral posts in the history of mankind as soon as you announce that you go to church more than one hour a week. Tell people that you can go to a church called the Creek. You can go to a church called the Tower. You can go to a church called the Creek Bank. You can go to a church called the River. You can go to a church called all of those things. But if you say you go to a Bible-believing Baptist church, all of a sudden, you're just a narrow-minded legalist. They'll call us names. They'll call us pharisaical. By the way, anybody ever calls you that, you know what they just said? They said you're not even saved. Pharisees weren't saved people. They'll call you a legalist. A legalist means that you have to work and earn your salvation. Do you know there is not an ounce of truth in that when you talk about Bible believing Christians? We believe that salvation is by grace plus nothing and minus nothing. It's not of works lest any man should boast. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. The fact is we believe the exact opposite of that. And so when someone says, well, you're nothing but a legalist and you're nothing but a Pharisee, they just told you you're not even saved. But as soon as you say, well, you're a compromiser, <gasps> don't call me names. Don't give me a title. I can't give you a title. We just said exactly what you are. You're a compromiser. You're probably like, wait a minute, what are you trying to say? Happiness requires a decision of discretion. How does someone go from believing, sitting in church, hearing preacher Walt preach every time he gets up and preaches from this book right here, listening to every Sunday school class, growing up in this youth group, how does he end up sitting there believing absolutely nothing and deciding that everything that, that you do is wrong and everything that he does, well, it's okay because he wants to do it. A person who used to believe the Bible now doesn't believe it. A person who used to come to church now doesn't darken the doors of a church house except maybe once a week when he shows up to his hip now happening church. How does it happen? They didn't make the decisions of discretion. Watch what the Bible says. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. I want you to notice first, there's this stroll of inquisition. There you are going to church, faithful, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, serving the Lord. There you are, involved in the ministries of Casper Baptist Church. And then all of a sudden, you start hearing something from someone else. You start going and reading a blog. Now I realize I'm in Casper, West Virginia. And I realize that some of you are trying to figure out how I just mispronounced the word log. <laughs> but there are many in this auditorium who know what a blog is. And you start reading it. Now you look at that blog and you say, now this guy doesn't go to church like I do. This guy doesn't look like I do. doesn't act like I do. When he reads scripture verses on his blog, it's not the same as what my Bible says. But you know what? I do find him interesting. I do find it I am inquisitive about what he has to say. I think I'm going to listen to him for just a little while. I think I'm going to ignore the fact that he's a Calvinist. I think I'm going to ignore the fact that he doesn't uh, believe the word of God. I think I'm just going to ignore all that because I'm just, I'm, I'm just inquisitive. I, I want to know what he has to say. I want to listen. And I'm just walking along. You ever stop and think about that? If you're walking with someone and you're singing step after step and they say something that you disagree with, you know how hard it is to go away from them? You just do that. And you've turned away from them, and you're gone. You're moving. Now you're moving in different directions. You are just taking a stroll, just walking along, just listening. Listen, Christian, I want to tell you something. We don't preach it near as hard as we should. We need to be extremely careful about what goes in these ears. Right, yes. We need to be extremely careful about what our children are watching, what they're listening to. Yeah. Well, he's a teenager now. I, I guess i got to let him. No, you don't. Right. You know when you let him do what he wants to do? When he stands at an altar and says, I do, then he has his own family there. Yeah. From that moment on, he is your responsibility. So right. remember, but he has to make his own decisions. Yes, he eventually will make his own decisions, but I'm here to tell you, if he grows up the right way, grows up in your family, he's going to make a lot better decisions when he's 18 than if you start letting him make decisions when he's 12. Yeah, yeah. Notice, please. You got to start. They, they want to have that stroll of inquisition. I wonder what they're saying. 
I'd like to hear, hear it from different viewpoints. Listen, there are lots of different viewpoints out there about a lot of things. But I'm here to tell you there's only one viewpoint that matters. Right. Only one. This one right here. Right. I wonder what they think about what God said. I don't care what they think about what God said. I just want to know what God said. Man should not live by a prayer alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And what Joe Schwartz said on his blog post this morning. That's not what it says. Right. It's by this book right here. You won't make the wrong decisions if you live by this book. Oh, are the don'ts uncomfortable? Has the Bible told me that I couldn't do something that I wanted to do on more than one occasion in my life? Yes. Hasn't it done the same thing to you? Right. Now you look back at the things that you didn't do because the Bible told you not to do them. And then you stop and think what a mess your life would have been had you not heeded the word of God. Where would you be today if it weren't for the discreet decisions of discretion. But nowadays, we're walking along. We're just strolling. We say to ourselves, it's no big deal. I can turn in an instant if he says the wrong thing. The stroll of the Inquisition. But it doesn't stop there. Listen to the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now notice what it says next. Nor standeth in the way of sinners. Standing means I'm not moving anymore. It is harder to, to, to start moving once you stop. And as we get older, isn't that more and more and more true? It used to be as a kid, you get up and you start moving and you run around. You look like a cartoon character with the legs moving before they start moving. You were like that. Now you get up and you said, I need to go in the other room. But it's all the way over there. <laughs> Maybe I can do without. Isn't that what we do? It's harder to start moving and move away from something once you're stationary. There's first that stroll of inquisition. Then there's the stand of influence. Now, not only do I want to hear this guy's opinion, but now I don't do anything until I listen to his blog. I don't do anything until I read what so-and-so says about it. I go home, and unlike the Bereans, what's the Bible say about the Bereans? These were more noble than those of the Thessalonica, for they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. They did that when the apostle Paul preached. They went home after Paul preached and made sure that Paul's preaching lined up with the word of God. They didn't go home and said, well, I saw what Paul preached, but what does Peter say about that on his blog I wonder if Bartholomew has mentioned anything in a paper that he's written. I wonder if St. Gretchen, my brother, my brother got a thing in the mail the other day from a, a preacher who's holding a prophecy conference on climate change. <laughs> he's going to preach from the word of God, climate change. You can come up with anything if you want to, can't you? You can twist the Bible and say anything you want to if your desire is to stand there and be influenced. There are guys nowadays preaching that will not even preach a message after they study it, after they see what the Bible says until they read what so-and-so says about it on their website. Blessed is the man. Happy is the man. Not just happy, oh so happy. Because he's not taking the stroll of the Inquisition. He's not in the stain of influence. And number three, he's not in the seat of indoctrination. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Notice the progression now. Please understand, I didn't write this. God did. It started with me being interested. I wonder what they have to say. I wonder how they interpret this. I wonder if they're living by the same stringent rules that I live by. Going to church three times a week. Giving Almighty God five whole hours in a week. What a sacrifice. You ever stop and think he gives us 168 hours in a week and we begrudgingly give him five? That's if the services go on. Oh, I just wanted to listen to what they had to say. Ooh, I can't make a move without listening to what they say. And now I'm seated right beside the them. Now I'm not the one listening to what they have to say. Standing where they want me to stand. Now I'm the one blogging about how silly it is to go to church. 
I'm the one posting on Facebook how these Bible-believing fundamentalists are so strict and pharisaical and legalistic. You and I have friends and former fellow church members that are sitting there criticizing everything that they used to believe and everything that they used to do because they took the stroll, they took the stand, and now they've taken their seat. <coughs> You know what else about them? They're just not happy. They're still not happy. They're not going to be happy until, and in their mind, until they convince you that you're wrong and they're right. And then once they convince you that you're wrong and they're right, then they'll find someone, something else to believe and change everything. Always looking for a new way to interpret a preacher friend of mine. was uh, His son grew up in the mission field, grew up serving the Lord. And he came down to visit him on the mission field not too long ago. And he was this uh, little girl came forward to the service and asked for, a, just wanted assurance of her salvation. And the, the, the missionary said to his son, well, did you give her 1 John 1, 9? And the young man said, I'm not sure that even applies to Christians. Who was John writing to? Of course it applies to Christians. But somebody on some blog somewhere told him that what he believed all of his life, what the Bible clearly teaches, is you know what? He's miserable. Right. There's the decisions of discretion. Don't take the stroll. Don't make. Don't take the stand. And don't take the seat. You want to be happy? Don't walk there. Don't stand there. And don't sit there. His delight is where. But here's the contrast. Not the, the, the decision of discretion. The, the decision of dedication. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Not in what everybody else has. Isn't it saying exactly what we said? It says, oh, I know what the Bible says, but I want to hear what he says. I want to hear what she believes. I want to hear what they posted. And, and it, the blessed is the man that ignores all of that and just stays right here. Right. Yeah. His delight, his satisfaction is in the law of the Lord. This is not just satisfaction. This word here, his delight, means he's overjoyed. He is so happy. He's literally, it means he's thrilled. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Do you remember when it used to thrill you to open your Bible? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, does it still thrill you? You know, we get there, we open up our Bible and say, well, I promised I was going to read so many chapters this week. Or I promised I was going to read my Bible through this year and I've got a job to do. I've got work to do. You know, we should open up our Bibles and be as excited every time we do as that four-year-old who goes to the zoo for the first time and sees his first elephant. That's how excited we ought to be about our Bibles. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Oh, I've got to read my Bible. Oh, I have to read my Bible this morning. Do you feel that way about it? Maybe that's why you're not, oh, so. His delight is in the law of the Lord. His, his total satisfaction is in the word of God. That's where it belongs, is it not? It's not in what everybody else is saying. It's not in what the TV preacher is saying. It's not in what the radio preacher is saying. It's what the Bible says. His delight, his meditation, his satisfaction. I'm sorry, his satisfaction is in the law of the Lord. Not just his satisfaction, notice the source. His delight is in the law of the Lord. This book right here. This book that's not going anywhere. This book that hasn't changed. There's not a person in this room over the age of, we'll just draw the line at 40. I can't speak <clears throat> to those of you under 40, but most, many of you are the same way. You look around and see what this world has become, especially in the last, let's just say, 15 years. And we have to acknowledge this isn't the same world that we grew up in. Right. It's not the same place. It keeps changing. Who would have thought that in your lifetime you would have to be asked a question when you go to school <coughs> what your preferred pronouns are? Who would have thought that you'd have to go to a place and see three different restaurants? Who would have thought that marriage between two men or two women was something that is just socially acceptable? Who would have thought there'd be protests because nine people dressed in robes said it is not legal to kill a baby just because you want to? Who would have thought that in our lifetimes? 
Everything seems to change. Nothing that was solid 20 years ago is solid today except one thing. Right. This yeah. book hasn't changed one little bit. Right. It hasn't altered. The words haven't gone away. And in spite of people trying to explain it away, it hasn't lost its power, its zeal, or its authority. The light's in the right source. His satisfaction's in the right source. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate, study. Not just satisfaction. This decision and devotion to the word of God, it's, it's our satisfaction. It's our source. And it's our, it's our study. It's, he meditates day and night. He's saturated in this book. Every morning he wakes up in it. Every night he goes to bed in it. Say, Brother Harper, wait a minute. That's... That sounds like a lot of time. No, you can be saturated in the Word of God without quitting your job and sitting there in your house reading the Bible 24 hours a day. You ever notice how you can read a verse in the morning and it affects you all day long? How many times have you read a verse first thing in the morning and seven or eight times during the day you said, hmm, that's what the Lord was saying this morning. That's what he was telling me. That's what he was warning me about. This book was written by the God who knows the end from the beginning. Thousands of years ago, knowing exactly what you would face tomorrow. I've said it here before, I'll say it again. This book has every answer you need tomorrow. Right. Right. Notice, he has the decision of devotion. He's got the right satisfaction, he's got the right source, the right study, the right saturation. And lastly, we finish with this, our time is up. He's got the right success. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That's a Hebrew picture there. Let me give you that real quick because it contrasts the chaff. Chaff is very light. You know, I'm sure you've heard this, that uh, it, oftentimes they would have to uh, harvest the wheat and the chaff. And what they would do is they would put it all in a blanket. They would shake it. The wheat would come falling back to earth. The chaff would blow away. The chaff, the wind drive it away, the Bible tells us here in this passage of Scripture. But this, if you're in your Bible, if you're not walking in the counting of God and not sitting in the seat of this corporal, uh, not, not, not standing in the way of sinners, and being blown around with every wind of doctrine, which is what the Bible says. But you're like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And the picture here is a tree between a stream that spreads up, uh, splits off into two. It's a stream that now has water on both sides of this tree, nourishing this tree. And this tree's roots keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until there's finally nothing that would ever shake it. How did you get that pipe? Your delight was in the law of the Lord. The Lord was trying to tell me I could never read a blog post. I didn't say that. What I said is, we, we, not you, this is not a, you people need to. I don't, I don't preach that way. I've never preached that way. We need to be incredibly cautious about what goes in. Yeah, because yeah. if it goes in here, it stays in yeah, here. Right. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how you can forget where you left your glasses? <laughs> you can forget where your car keys are. By the way, I think my car keys are in your house. So I just want to thank you. <laughs> I remember that last night after looking for him for 15 minutes. But, uh, you can forget just about everything, but you hear something wrong. Doesn't the devil remind you of that 400 times a day? Doesn't it sink in? Won't you say three years later, I remember a guy said one time. A lady was talking about <gasps> last week, at our last meeting, and she said she heard a preacher say one time that Jonah actually went to hell. Really? How's that possible? Because the Bible says the Bible is written by holy men of God, and holy men can't go to hell. She said, well, that's just what that preacher said. I don't remember anything else he said. I don't even remember who it was. But you know what she remembered? The heresy that he spoke. Because it'll stay there forever. Wouldn't it be better to delight in this? Amen. Be like a tree. Yeah. Wouldn't it be better to stand where you've always stood? And here's the thing. Why don't we wear that I'm just an old-fashioned fundamentalist that believes what I've always believed? Why don't we wear that as a badge of honor instead of a criticism? 
Because when you ask them what they believe, they look at you and they go, uh, because they can never give you an answer. You want to be happy? Not just, oh, I found a decaffeinated Earl Grey tea in our cabinet today. My wife had just said, I'm not going to have Earl Grey today. She's become addicted to Earl Grey tea. It's just amazing how bad that is. I tried for years to get her to drink tea, but she wouldn't. Now she can't live without this, right? I found one. I gave it to her. She was so thrilled. But that's, that's just momentary happiness because the teacup's empty now. She's not still happy with that Earl Grey tea. This is the kind of happiness that doesn't just come and go. This is, oh, so happy. When's the last time you were, oh, so happy? You can be, but it starts right here. It's that word for it. Lord, I'm thank you this morning. Well, thank you for our time together, Lord. Thank you for your word, what it says, what it means. Father, help us to stand on it in Jesus' name.